Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. against the authority of God and there is a consequence to sin and it is a severe consequence. But it's not just... Whenever Marty preaches, the elders give me the chance to go visit another church. And so sometimes it's a very conservative church. In this case, it was not conservative at all. This was Rock City Church down in Columbus in the Hilliard area. And I, when I took the videos, I didn't plan on showing them this morning, so that's why they're not, in my opinion, the best. It's why you saw the sound and video equipment instead of seeing more of the uh, worship service itself. So I just wanted to show some of our video guys and, and some, some of this stuff. So it wasn't planned to show it this morning. That's another reason it was so short. But we're going to come back to this and talk about it just a little bit later then. Today, begin, we begin... Be, I'll get it out. We begin with a new mini-series on evangelism. We're going to have three messages on evangelism leading us up to our fall kickoff on September the 11th when we'll start working on this book here, Pray Like the King. And we're going to have our sermons out of this book and we'll read along with it and so forth. When we get done with that, we will go back to um, our epic journey through the Bible. And by the time we get through that next section of that, it's probably going to be Christmas time. Hey, it's coming, folks. It's coming fast. So if, if you want this book, if you, if you ordered one, Nancy will have them downstairs for sale. If you did not order one, uh, go ahead and sign your name, and we'll get you a book eventually. We just don't know how much it'll cost and so forth. So we're selling to the ones that signed up first. So exciting here the next uh, several months coming up. So today we begin this series called Evangelism, Telling Others About Jesus. If there's one area that the church, the Western church will say, Europe, United States, and so forth has failed at in the last 50 to 100 years, it's evangelism. It's on telling other people about Jesus. Now, 50, 60 years ago, we would do door-to-door -door evangelism. And we'd knock on a door just unannounced and tell somebody about Jesus. And the, people really aren't open to that much anymore. They don't like that just knocking and who are you and telling, us, telling them about Jesus or whatever. So it's, it's changed over the years. Our cultures change. So we're going to start a class September the 20th here at church in the evenings. Hope to start it maybe around 7 o'clock. Maybe we can squeeze that down to 6.30 and... Uh, get you here and get you out. And we'll start it September the 20th. We'll have it done at least by the week before Thanksgiving. So it'll be uh, seven, eight weeks, something like that. I do have a vacation in there, so there'll be a week off. And so we're going to teach about how to evangelize. Now, I've got to learn too, because you know what? After all that time of being in Bible college, never had one class on evangelism. Never one class in seminary on evangelism. I don't remember one day of talking about evangelism in class. So we're all going to be learning this together. There'll be more information on it coming out next week in the newsletter. Sadly, when we're talking about evangelism, 
Most Christians are afraid to do it. Oh, why are we afraid? Well, let's look at that. Why are we afraid to tell others? First of all, we fear that we don't know enough. Yeah, some of us have been Christians for decades. And the Bible is such a vast, huge book, and we still don't think that we know enough to tell anybody else. Why don't we know enough? Well, that's our second reason here. We spent too much time wasted on things. You know what? Most Christians can tell you anything you want to know about some aspect of sports or politics or TV shows, movies, environmental things. But when it comes to the Bible and telling others about Jesus, we don't know. Well, because we've wasted too much time on other things. We're not trained. And admittedly so, maybe a pretty good excuse. On the other hand, all you have to do is tell your story. How did you come to Jesus? And how are you living in Jesus? And a lot of times that's all that's need. But we'll tell you more in the class. And number four is we're depending upon others. In other words, we don't want to do it. So we're saying, well, I'll just let the other Christian, brother such and such, sister such and such, they, they can tell somebody about Jesus, and not me. Put on the other person's responsibility. Number five, we're afraid of looking different. I bet you we've all been in situations with family or friends, and we saw something going on that we knew that we should have spoken up. Maybe it was a simple question about, the Bible or Jesus, and we didn't answer. We didn't want to make a mistake or show our ignorance. Or maybe we should have spoken up to say something against what was going on, and we didn't want to be the oddball. We didn't want to be the one that they would say, oh, you're the Jesus nut. You're the fanatic. And so we didn't want to look different. Now, sadly, this last one is really bad. We're afraid that we're a bad example. The Bible's got a word for it. It's called hypocrite. But let me assure you, we're all hypocrites, every last one of us. The apostle Peter was a hypocrite. If you remember in the Bible, he was acting one way and he shouldn't have been. And the apostle Paul come along and said, Peter, what are you doing? Straighten up, act differently. So Peter was a hypocrite also. We're all hypocrites. But some of us, know that we're not living what we would be teaching others about Jesus. And so we just think, well, I'm going to get pointed out for my hypocrisy, so I'm just going to shut up. Six reasons we're afraid to tell others about Jesus. But you know what? This is a mini-series on evangelism. The class is going to be on evangelism. And what we're going to learn is that it takes every one of us, it takes every last one of us, to tell others. So today we begin with this, it takes all of us. Why does it take all of us? Well, because we're all different. See, I can reach people that you can't reach, and you can reach people that I can't reach, because we are all different. How do we know this works this way? Let's look at Jesus' disciples. Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and thick sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus chose men of a variety of backgrounds. So what are those backgrounds? Well, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the most famous of all the 12 apostles, they were fishermen. We know them best because their names stand out. Their, their names are mentioned often in the scriptures. These were the working class people. We'd call them the blue-collar people, the laborers. These men would get up in the middle of the night and fish. They would skin their fish. They would sell them. And, and a lot of hours they would put in every day. A lot of labor. But we might say the same thing of the next three guys. 
That is Philip, Bartholomew, and Thomas. I didn't realize this until I was doing the research this week. John chapter 21 names them along with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. So it sounds, scholars think, that they were all fishermen. Sea of Galilee area, maybe up all in Capernaum. But these were also common laborers also, and a little bit different personalities. It's thought that Philip was the organizer. Now I'm getting these from John MacArthur's book on the 12 disciples, so uh, blame him if you don't agree. It's thought that Philip was the organizer, that if Jesus had something he wanted done, uh, Philip, take care of it, and Philip would get it done. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, was a friend of Philip's, don't really know too much about him. And Thomas fits in with Philip, also in Nathaniel. Uh, Thomas, we know, is a doubter, and, and uh, maybe the realist. The guy that would say, okay, I, I see the situation coming, but what's the best scenario? What's the worst scenario? Let's, let's be ready for whatever happens. So that might be the kind of guy that Thomas is. Then there's Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector. Now, set this up. Jesus has some of his disciples already picked. They're following him. And then he calls on Matthew. Matthew's the traitor to the Jews. Matthew was the friend of the Roman government. Matthew worked for the Roman government to take the money, the tax money, from the Jews, these other guys, and then Matthew made money on that by charging more, so there's a good chance Matthew was pretty rich, and he was hated. So you can imagine, Jesus has this little band of disciples that's following him, and then he invites Matthew in. Can you imagine what they were saying? Matthew, why Matthew? He's He's a bad guy. Who wants Matthew here? Of course, then the next guy is Simon the Zealot. I mean, Simon the Zealot is the opposite of Matthew. The Zealot was a guy that worked against Rome. He was the underground, the Jewish underground that would thwart things against Rome. So here you have Matthew, the friend of Rome, Simon the Zealot, who was against Rome. Matter of fact, Jesus might have saved Simon the Zealot's life. Simon the Zealot could have done something so atrocious to the Roman government that he might have found himself hanging on the cross beside Jesus and the two uh, thieves. Now, can you imagine? Jesus has these disciples. He's got Matthew in, and then in comes Simon the Zealot. I don't know what order they came in, but can you imagine Simon the Zealot and Matthew, hey, he sent them out two by two. Matthew, Simon, you two. Well, we don't know if that happened or not, but that's, that's kind of Jesus-like. Learn to get along. And then we have, uh, let's see, James, son of Alphaeus, also known as James the Lesser. Uh, goes along with James the Lesser. We know a little about him. Uh, Thaddeus, or Judas, son of James. Know almost nothing about him also. And then there's Judas Iscariot, the traitor, betrayed Jesus into the hands of the Jewish leaders and then led to the crucifixion. Judas Iscariot was the treasure. That makes us wonder, why didn't Matthew? Well, why wasn't he the treasure? He handled money. Jesus evidently had a purpose to pick Judas Iscariot as their treasure, the money keeper for the group. Then we know that the Gospel of John tells us that Judas Iscariot also had his fingers in the kitty. He was dipping from the money that they were collecting and saving and so forth, so he was also a thief. Why did Jesus pick such a diverse group of disciples? We don't have an answer. He, he never does tell us, but we could maybe use some logic. Let's imagine that Peter and Andrew want to go tell a, a, a businessman, a tax collector, about Jesus. And they go over and they start talking maybe some coarse fish language. And Matthew runs over to him, no, 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 guys, you can't do it like that. You can't do it like that. Let me show you how you talk to Jesus with these guys. In other words, just the same as each of us have different backgrounds and we understand people in our backgrounds better than somebody else, uh, 
they would have had distinct abilities to talk with their own type of people with the various backgrounds. Or maybe they would come up and say, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're doing it wrong. Let me show you how to do this. Or maybe they'd say, let me just take over. See, the, the diverseness there was an advantage to reach the diverse number of people. So it takes all of us to reach a diverse world. It takes all of us, that point, there we go. It takes all of us to reach a diverse world. And it's the same thing as back then as it is today. This is why we need the church to be so diversified. Let's talk about our opening video just a little bit, Rock City Church. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want to see any response yet. I'll, I'll tell you when I want the response. So the question is going to be for you to ponder. How many of us would love to worship at Rock City Church every Sunday? Now, let me tell you just a little bit more about it. The music was the loudest I've ever been in any church. And the person I was with said, oh, no, they'd been in one other up in the Toledo area that was louder. You've all been to, I'm assuming many of you have been to rock concerts or Christian rock concerts where it's so loud and the bass hits you, the, the, the waves, sound waves hit you. Whatever part of my body was not blocked by someone in front of me or by the seat, I mean, I was getting it. It was phenomenal, but I loved it. And, and the music was loud. I've always said I'd love to preach at a church that I needed to wear a cotton in my ears and that I wouldn't know all the music. Well, I didn't know the music, but I enjoyed the music. And I found I didn't need cotton in my ears because when you're hearing, when you get old enough, your hearing starts going bad. So it wasn't all that loud. But 20 years ago, I would have probably needed the cotton in my ears. I absolutely loved being there. So, now we're ready. How many of us, and I got no response in first service, how many of us would love to worship at Rock City Church every Sunday? Okay, I got, got a few of you. Okay, that's good. Okay, so somebody did tell me uh, they, they actually attend Rock City Church. Uh, their, their kids attend Rock City Church, one of the other ones in Columbus. So how many would enjoy going there once in a while? Okay, we'll get, get a few more. Okay. I just didn't ask the right question in first service. It takes all of us. It, it, I don't think anybody from Rock City Church would want to worship here. And that's fine. At least not to stay here all the time. And there were all ages there. Not quite as many older ones as what we have here maybe, but uh, percentage-wise. But still, there were all ages. So... Many of us wouldn't want to worship there. Many of them wouldn't want to worship here. But see, by our diversity, we're reaching. All people are different varieties of people. When I was at Johnson Bible College, the reason I went to Johnson, one of the reasons is because they were catering to non-traditional students, us older guys and gals. And there was this one guy, he was a year behind me, I think, big birdie guy. I mean, big. His arms were probably as big or just about as big as my thighs, which isn't saying much about my build, but this guy was big. Now, in Tennessee, we were living there all year round because we were non-traditional. If you've ever been in the Knoxville area in the summertime, it's hot. It, comparable to here, but the first summer I was down there, it was unbearable hot, and it lasted way into fall. And this guy always wore long sleeves. So one day I asked him, I said, why? He rolled his sleeves up and he said, this is why. And his arms were covered with tattoos all the way up, both of them. He says, I don't want to be the oddball. I said, man, get over it. I said, these kids will love on you. And this was a lovable, huggable guy. I mean, this guy just, he had a personality uh, about him that draw, draws you to him. And so the next day, there he was, short sleeve shirt. Kids were loving it. They were asking about his tattoos. Faculty loved him. It didn't make any difference. Now, let me ask you a question. If a rough and tough crowd came to some event here in Crytersville, and there are these big, burly guys, tattoos all over the place. They got a beverage in their hand. They got a cigarette in their other hand or they might be smoking something else, and they're 
they're, they're engaging, they're having fun, they're doing things that you and I wouldn't do. How far do you think I would get if I went to try to tell them about Jesus? Man, they would bite me up. They would chew me and then spit me out. But this guy that was at Johnson Bible College, this big birdie guy with the tattoos, how far do you think he'd get with that group? A lot farther than I would. See, it takes all of us to reach the different kind of people. That works for church services, the type of music. It takes all kinds of things. Let's get over the bias against churches that don't worship quite the same way that we do. Let's get over the bias of people that look different than you and I do. And, you know, this used to be a big thing back when I was growing up or younger. And it was even kind of so here when I first came. And I think our, we're, we're changing with the culture enough that most of us are getting to accept things that people that are different than us and churches and so forth that are different than us. So let's not think that way. We all have a different understanding and view of Jesus, that we worship our, our likes and dislikes. As long as we're not changing the message, let's not worry about it. Once in a while, I'll see an, a social media post of somebody, especially the older generation, and in this case, a couple of semi-retired preachers that like to knock today's preachers. PhD educated preachers are watering down the message and this and that. They, they make comments like we need to get this younger generation taught the old hymns and so forth. I have a hard time. My fingers just want to get on there and type something back in that I shouldn't do and I have to bite my hands. And, and recently, that post that they put up, they took it down. Hopefully, their grandkids or somebody set them straight. I've been in several churches, not all churches, Christ, Christian churches. I visit denominational churches and so forth. And I've never heard one that watered down the scripture. Now, they're, they're saying the same thing as they have for the last hundred years. We may not agree theologically, but they're not watering down the scriptures. And the music, it, it may not be the hymns, but it's just as theological sound as what the old hymns are. Besides, I can think of some old hymns that aren't quite theological safe to what we believe either, but we sing them or used to sing them. Let's be careful not to throw stones. And I'm not throwing stones at us. Please believe me. Not throwing stones at anybody here. We've all gone through, uh, those of us that are older, have all gone through a time when things were changing. Things were changing such as, you ladies always had to wear dresses to church. You remember that day? And then I can remember the day that my wife wanted to wear a pantsuit to church. Now, those of you that are young enough, pantsuits were just the, the stage before slacks and blue jeans. They were the top and the bottom both matched. And I can remember that, that discussion that we had. And, you know, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's. And then I can remember the first time that we wore blue jeans to Sunday night church. And I can remember myself... Growing up with, you had to wear a white shirt and a tie and a sports jacket. Remember that, guys? And then we got radical. We went to a, a colored shirt and tie and jacket. And then we finally lost the jacket. Then we lost the tie. Now we come in blue jeans. And some of you come in shorts. It's great. But you know what? In that transition period, some of us said things we shouldn't have. And we lost some people because we wouldn't accept their dress code. Uh, they wouldn't accept our dress code because we wanted to keep them as we were. And we lost some people. A lot of churches lost people. It's time we stop throwing stones. Is it the word of God? Are we worshiping? And what I saw down at Rock City Church the other day, okay, it's, it's maybe not some of our style, but I saw worship. Genuine Worship. Other preachers that water it down? Yeah, I can think of one. He's a TV preacher. Huge church. A lot of people follow him. A lot of you have read his books. And at first I threw stones at him because he's, he's 
not preaching the, the word like he should. And then I remembered back when I was around 22 years old, going to church every Sunday, three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I come up on a preacher, this was an older guy, that kind of preached a little bit of a watered down message. But when I was at that age and that stage of life, I needed his message. I read his books. He was feeding me in a way that I wasn't getting it from the local congregation. And I'm not throwing stones at the local preacher. I was just in a stage I needed something different along with the sermons that I was getting. And he helped solidify, this, this other preacher helped solidify my faith where I'm at. So let's be careful not to throw stones at the TV preacher that's maybe a little watered down to what we believe, doesn't quite preach the way that we do, doesn't quite same beliefs, but God is using him to reach people that you and I aren't going to reach. And he's using us to reach people that he will never reach either. So, as Christians, we're supposed to evangelize. What are we to do? Well, let's go to Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. We call it the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, if we had cliff notes on that little passage right there, it would have one word. Go. That's it in a nutshell. Go. Jesus commands us to go tell people about Jesus. Go tell people about Jesus. Jesus. Go where? Well, now we have to ask, where are we going to go to? Well, for that, we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem. Right after this, Jesus ascends into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So where do we start? Right in our own community. Start in your own community. It's that simple. You know what we do, though? We give money to missions. And that's good. I'm not knocking that. We are to be a missional church. But a lot of times we give money to missions and say, I've done my duty. And then we don't witness to the people that we're around. It takes both. To witness to the people we're around in our city, in our community, in our state, and to people in other areas. Now, some of us have gone on missionary trips. But the main part is we give money. That's biblical. Both are very, very biblical. And remember this. It's not our job to win people to Jesus. It's not our job to win people to Jesus. It's our job to tell them about Jesus. It's our job to tell them. We don't know where we're at in the process. We might be the first one that ever tells them about Jesus and they just snub their noses and we're offended like it doesn't work. Or we might be the last one that tells them about Jesus and they'll become a Christian. We might be someplace in between. Our job is to tell them it's God's job, the Holy Spirit's job to work on them, to bring them to Christ. You know, the problem is many of us, too many of us are sleepwalking. We see somebody telling others about Jesus and we don't agree with them theologically. We don't agree with what they're saying. We don't agree with that person's lifestyle. We don't agree where they're going. Yet we ourselves aren't doing anything about telling people that we're around. See what we're saying? We're sleepwalking. 
We'll throw stones at somebody else, but yet we're not doing the job either. We all have to go and tell others. So let's wrap this up. And please understand, I'm not throwing any stones at anybody. Please understand that. It's, it's our culture, what the church culture has become, and it's the preacher's fault for letting it go that way. So let's remember, you can reach people that I can't reach. I can reach people that you can't reach. It takes all of us, every last one of us. And this is what this class is going to be about. This is what the next couple messages are going to be about. We'll get a little bit more into the details in the next couple weeks of evangelism, and then we'll get into a lot more details in the class. Jesus said that the fields are ripe. They're ready for harvest. He needs the workers. Evangelism is each of us telling others about Jesus. And the question for us this morning is, what are you doing? And what am I doing about it? Let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, kind of a tough message to point at most of us probably I, I'm assuming here because I know how difficult it is at times to tell others about you or to, to just, just to witness for Jesus we're scared so Father help us as we go through this mini series in the class that we can learn and we can develop this uh, uh, confidence and here again, let's, let's not forget about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let's not forget, as Christians, you give us part of you. You give us you to help us to be the witness to somebody else. So help us to be bold. Help us to reach out to others as Jesus did. And it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscoffchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.